during this pandemic, we didn't choose to be in this situation, but we choose how we respond to the situation. And I think we are here at a moment where, ta- where recruiting leaders, HR leaders have a critical role to play, right? Recruiters are here to match people to jobs. Well, that's actually going to be probably the most important thing we have to do as a society over the next two years is to match people back to the right jobs. Welcome to another episode of the People Hum interview series. I'm your host, Samita Mariam, and let's begin with a quick introduction of People Hum. People Hum is an end to end, one view integrated human capital management automation platform. The winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work. We run the People Hum blog and media channel, which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year, and publish around two interviews with well known names globally every month. And now for our guest, Jerome Tenning is the founder and CEO of Smart Recruiters. He's also the author of Hiring Success, How Visionary CEOs Compete for the Best Talent. His goal is to bring the economy to its full potential by removing friction in the labor market, giving businesses access to the talent they need to succeed, helping people find a job they love. We are extremely happy and honored to have him on our interview series today. Welcome, Jerome. We are thrilled to have you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. It's it's a pleasure. So, moving on to the interview, Jerome, the first question I have for you. You know, can you tell us a little bit about your work, a little bit about Smart Recruiters? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Smart Recruiters is a uh, technology company founded in uh, San Francisco about uh, nine years ago now. Uh, we're a talent acquisition suite. Um, so we help enterprises attract, select, and hire uh, talent. So we manage all the processes of, uh, of recruiting. Uh, we're the generational successor um, to the applicant tracking system, right? So we replace Teleo, Brass Ring, all these systems with a modern talent acquisition suite. And we do that for larger enterprises such as Bosch, Visa, IKEA, Twitter, um, LinkedIn um, uh, uses us as well for their for their hiring. Wow, that's wonderful. I mean, that's huge. So, um, you know, coming a little bit to your book, can you tell us something about, you know, hiring success, how visionary CEOs compete for the best talent? A little bit mm-hmm. about it. Sure. I, I published this book a few weeks ago, um, really from the need uh, that I saw for CEOs to and executives to understand how uh, to hire great talent. Uh, it really strikes me that most CEOs actually put hiring great talent as one of their top concerns. Um, 80% of CEOs actually put uh, hiring as uh, uh, one of their top concerns. But at the same time, 80% of Fortune 500 believe they don't hire great people. And so I, why is that, right? How can it be that the CEO says, this is really important, but actually the companies aren't able to do that. And I think historically, we have looked at recruiting, at staffing as a as a back office function, as a cost uh, driven function that you know needs to be uh, automated and needs to be made faster and cheaper, right? So the, the typical metrics for recruiting are time to fill and cost per hire, faster and cheaper. It absolutely doesn't talk about uh, the value add of recruiting, which is if you have the best people, you are the best company. And so Hiring Success really is a book for the C-suite to say, oh, you want to hire great people, you want to out-hire your competition, you want to win because you have the best people, this is how you do it. And it's really turning recruiting into a sales and marketing function um, where you can programmatically become great at attracting better talent than your competition. Wow, that's wonderful. I mean, I think that is a really needed book at this time. So... um... According to you, what would be the future of recruitment? Recruitment um, is emerging uh, out of of an administrative function, right? We went from, you know, staffing to recruiting to talent acquisition, and we're now transitioning into hiring success, which means a few things. Uh, First, it means we measure ourselves differently. 
uh, and uh, more and more organizations uh, are adopting the hiring success framework for that uh, and the methodology. And uh, the hiring success scorecard uh, measures quality through a net hiring score. It works like an NPS. Um, so on a scale of one to 10, how much of a fit is this candidate for you? And how much of the job is, uh, how much of a fit is this job for you? Is a question you ask the candidate and the manager 90 days after hire, and then you run an NPS. Those who are like nine and 10, yeah, best job I ever had, best person, minus the one to five, those who are like, mm, not great, right? And you end up with a positive negative score that actually tells you, are you hiring more great fits than bad fits? And this score is very, very important to track. More and more companies track that. Second, instead of measuring time to fill, which is like, oh, my time to fill is 57 days. Nobody cares that your time to fill is 57 days, like start earlier, right? You actually measure hiring velocity, which is the percentage of jobs that are filled on time which is a very important metric for the C-suite because if you say, hey, Jerome, 90%, we have a hiring velocity of 90%, that means 90% of my uh, uh, jobs are going to be filled when I need them to be filled, which means if I want to launch a new product and I need engineers and salespeople and this, I know that I will have the people to actually do that. If I'm opening a new store, I'll have the people on the day of the opening, right? So hiring velocity and business velocity correlate nicely. Now, if you actually have a net hiring score for quality and a hiring velocity for business velocity, you can then discuss your hiring budget as a percentage of the new hire salary. So instead of saying, oh, we have a cost per hire of $2,000, which frankly, I don't care um, as a CEO, uh, you actually can say, I have a, a, we have a hiring budget of 6% of our new hire salary. And now if you say that, now I can say, okay, well, hold on. How does that compare to our competition? Well, unfortunately, uh, ma'am, uh, our competition is investing closer to nine or 10%. We are under investing in recruiting. As a result, as you can see, the velocity and the net hiring score are not great, right? So now you're actually having a business conversation about hiring. I think the future of recruiting stands in emerging out of being a staffing function and really becoming a value add function where CEOs compete for the best talent and they actually outperform their competition for the best talent. And you know, I, I often hear people are like, yeah, this is important, especially for senior roles. And yeah, it's very important for senior roles, but the truth is it's important across the board, right? Yeah. And I, I, asked, I asked this question the other day to someone, I said, have you ever met a jerk at an Apple store? Right? And the answer is no, you, you don't. They're just, there are no jerks in Apple store. Oh, that's interesting. At least because you think Apple hire jerks and then they train them to not be jerks or do they hire the right people in the first place, right? And what would your impression of the brand be if you met a jerk in an Apple store one day? Would that, how likely would that make you to come back the next day? And you can apply this across the board to the barista in your coffee shop, to the cashier in your supermarket, to the person uh, uh, answering the phone, to your banker, to everybody, right? It's across the board. Who you hire defines everything in an organization. And I think really CEOs are starting to realize that and they invest in recruiting to hire great talent, just like you invest in marketing to get more customers. Wow, that's wonderful. I mean, that's a very detailed explanation. And, you know, it's, I think it's very important to invest in talent because, you know, you, you need to have that pipeline right there for you, you know, to increase, you know, you, you can, you know, just raise your bars of goals if you have the right talent. So that's amazing. And, yes. you know, for organizations trying to build a talent brand, what would your advice be? You know, the talent brand is really uh, uh, at the intersection of uh, your product brand, your investor brand, and then your people brand, right? And uh, that actual brand is something that uh, is critical in how you actually are able to attract and retain the right people. Um, over the last decade, we lost, we lost control over the brand, right? We used to have a nice advertising saying we are the best and then the reality was not the same right unfortunately now the reality is exposed on the web with websites like glassdoor and increased transparency 
So you actually cannot fake it anymore. So you actually now really need to build a brand based on who you really are, which drives better behaviors in organizations. And I would, uh, uh, I would encourage organization here to uh, invest in uh, having the right processes, the right reviews, and the right programs to gradually build their brand. If you talk about recruiting, there's a simple one. How about you start by answering to candidates who apply to your jobs? Right? Because mm, if you ask the candidate, they're not getting an answer. There's like, I applied, I never heard back. I'm not going back to this store, right? Those are, those are actual consumers. There's a good study actually on this um, done by Virgin uh, um, in, uh, in the UK a few couple of years ago. They actually correlated their rejected applicants with uh, cancellations in their service, in their phone service. And they realized that not answering to candidates was costing them seven million pounds a year in just service being canceled by pissed off candidates, right? And that's a reality. So get, get behind your brand. Your, your brand as an employer is, is critically important and your talent brand, especially in times like now where a lot of people are unemployed. Many people you might have actually have to lay off and how you handle them will define who you are as an organization. So hold, hold and cherish your employer brand in the same way that you cherish your product brand or your investor brand. Those are really the three pillars of, of branding for an organization. Wow. Yeah, that's so right. I mean, the way we hire and the way we maintain, you know, these employees matter so much, especially at, you know, times of crisis. So that's, that's insightful. And, you know, what role do you believe automation and AI have to play in hiring and creating a better employee experience? Yeah, I think AI and automation have a very big role to play. Um, the truth is, recruiters uh, in organizations are buried uh, by administrative tasks right they're buried in in reviewing resumes they're bearing answering to candidates they're bearing scheduling interviews they're buried chasing feedback from managers they're buried making offers they're buried uh, onboarding candidates and they absolutely have no time uh, to add value they have no time to improve themselves right and so I think the, the role of AI here and automation is to actually free time for the recruiters, for the managers, for the HR leaders to add value, to do a proper job. Like, you know, take a simple task, read a resume and decide whether this person, uh, we should give them a call for a phone screen. A machine can read a resume at least as well, if not better than a human, quite frankly, right? Uh, nowadays, uh, the machine has more information about resumes than you do, right? Because they see that if you graduated from this university with this major, maybe as a recruiter, you know this industry or this university, maybe you don't, maybe you don't know this major, but actually the AI happens to have read over a million resumes who actually have some sort of skills like this. And they know that people who actually graduated from this university start in this and this job, and they tend to be promoted two years later at a faster rate than people who didn't, and they have these skills. And when they get to this job, that means they're acquiring those skills and this company is better than that. Like the AI has so much more information than the recruiter to say, not to say you should hire this person, but to at least say, hmm, this is a resume I think you should look at. This person is, is, is worth a conversation, right? And, uh, uh, and to actually help you do that. Um, now, in the role of automation, at a similar level, uh, which is when you have people that are interested in roles, like why would you ask uh, people to apply if they are not a fit? Like, you know, the, yes, the AI can help you filter, but is that a good experience? Do you actually want people to apply? So. We, uh, we started here um, using our AI, actually. We started to uh, uh, encourage customers to advertise jobs only to pre-qualified candidates. So don't, don't encourage people to apply to jobs where they're gonna be rejected, but actually go and say, oh, I have a new job. Look in the database, see what is a 
a hundred, a thousand people that you've actually spoken with before that are good qualified and then market your jobs to these people first and then, you know, have, the, have them come back. So now for, for, for the candidates, it's a lot easier because you say, oh, if you want to work for us, submit a profile, we'll let you know if anything is matching, right? You're not in any expectation. You're just saying, I'm interested in this company. And then jobs are coming to you. So it's a great experience, right? And for the recruiters on the other side, it's great because instead of receiving 100, 500, we have some customers who are now when they advertise, like if you're Visa or some big brand like this, you advertise a job, you're getting a thousand applicants overnight. Like what do you do with a thousand resumes, right? Yes, the AI can help you filter them, but that's not the point, right? So instead of getting a thousand applicants, you're going to get 50 or 30 but they are pre-qualified. So there's a lot of automation and the list goes on. Scheduling is another area, right? We used to spend a ton of time on scheduling. We launched a self-scheduling functionality. So now people kind of schedule themselves um, and uh, uh, the question and answer side of things, uh, all the onboarding, all the processes are onboarding. So there's a lot of work that can be done in automation with the purpose of improving the experience of candidates, employees, recruiters, and managers, right? I think we're really here, and you guys know this well, we're here about elevating the employee experience. And we work with many companies on this topic. I mentioned LinkedIn service now is also a customer of smart recruiters, and they are all about the experience and how we lift the experience uh, for employees and candidates, critically important. Yeah, that's that's that makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, along with increasing the experience of employees and recruiters and candidates, it, it saves us a lot of time. I mean, we have to think about technology where it comes in a handful. So that's wonderful. And also as an extension to this particular question. So there is a lot of subconscious bias in recruitment, right? So do you think technology is the answer to tackle this, you know, the subconscious bias in recruitment? Yes, I, I think technology can, um, can help a lot uh, in, uh, in uh, reducing bias um, and in fighting discrimination, right? And I was actually uh, um, writing about this in my book and, uh, um, and uh, frequently uh, over the internet. Uh, two examples. One, um, the example I took earlier about screening resumes there's massive discrimination happening in screening resume recently the bbc did a did an experiment where the same resume was sent to a hundred companies with a different name one resume was called the guy was called mohammed something and the other he was called adam something well guess what with the same resume adam got four times more callbacks than mohammed nice and easy right and this is with big companies in the UK who would tell you, no, 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 we don't have bias, right? Well, if you implement an AI for this, guess what? The AI doesn't have that bias. It still has a bias that if you went to Harvard, you're probably a better candidate than if you learned your skills at, on Udemy. Yes, so there is still a ground of like, yes, experience and education matter, but at least you, re you remove all the bias uh, that is linked to name, address, religion, you know, and, and other things that shouldn't be part of it. The second example I would give where technology can help is in enforcing a process and transparency. So for example, if you use smart recruiters against a job, you define a scorecard, which is the interview scorecard. How are we going to evaluate candidates? And there's a whole topic about how to do good scorecards, right? But the point being, that then all the interviewers have to fill the same scorecard and they fill it in a cards down mode. So you don't see the result, uh, what other people have written until you write your own, right? Uh, so you don't get influence and you don't get group thinking. So now you end up evaluating candidates in a transparent manner against job specific criteria and that leaves no room for discrimination. Nobody is gonna is gonna write on the scorecard, I don't like women, or I don't think we should hire a person that's not Jewish, or whatever their their discrimination might be. Right? We have to realize that bias and discrimination, bias is a human nature. Like we are as human, we are conditioned to associate 
to people who look like us. It's just, it's just who we are. Like you go to a party, you find somebody who loves sailing and you love sailing. Now you're best buddies, right? I mean, this is who we are. The problem is hiring is not a social encounter. It's a job interview. It is actually a precise evaluation of will this person perform a good job? And many people let that become a social encounter and the outcome is, yeah, I like this person. Yeah, well, who did you like? Well, I like because, and then you have a list of wrong reasons, right? So forcing the technology can force on the upper end uh, with AI to reduce bias and through transparency and process to enforce the right way of hiring. Wow, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for that answer. I mean, that was, that was a great answer. And, uh, you know, uh, Jerome, just to kind of wrap up the interview process, if you have any last, you know, important sound bites you would like to leave our audience. So if you, uh, um, if you are a recruiter in-house uh, or an HR leader, um, go to your ATS right now your applicant tracking system right now, your HIS, and unpost the jobs that you are not hiring for. There are many jobs out there that are just left out there, but you're not really hiring, you're in a hiring freeze. Candidates spend day in, day out applying to jobs that are not real, right? It's not good for you. You're getting 2,000 applicants. You might think, oh, I'm pipelining for the future. No, no, that's not a good way to pipelining, right? Because if you're not hiring, that's fake advertising. So if you're not hiring, unpost your job and be, be real and help people on, on the market. The second is um, during this pandemic, we didn't choose to be in this situation, but we choose how we respond to the situation. And I think we are here at a moment where, ta where recruiting leaders, HR leaders, have a critical role to play, right? Recruiters are here to match people to jobs. Well, that's actually going to be probably the most important thing we have to do as a society over the next two years is to match people back to the right jobs, right? As tens of millions of people have lost their jobs and we're going to need to match them back so we get the economy restarting. Uh, that means recruiters uh, have a critical role to play. So step up, mentor somebody. If you are yourself unemployed, if you've been furloughed, then pick up the phone or post on LinkedIn. How can I help you? We have created the reverse recruiting movement, um, uh, which actually encourages recruiters or anybody really to mentor job seekers. And it's not hard. Like you don't need to do much. You just pick up the phone to a friend who has been laid off and you say, hey, how can I help, right? And guess what, you can help, right? So step up as a recruiting uh, leader, as a recruiter or as anybody uh, and help us get people back to jobs. Wow, thank you so much for that, Jerome. That was wonderful. And you know, I, I want to thank you for your time and your energy you spent with us, you know, to give us these wonderful insights. And it was an amazing, enriching experience for me personally. And it will be for our audience too. So thank you so much for your time and have a healthy and safe time ahead of you. Have a great day. Great. Thank you so much.